So we are going to continue uh, this presentation uh, with a short introduction also on the global economic governance from, as well, an American perspective. This presentation will be given by Mr. Ole Moore, Associate Director, Geoeconomic Center, Economic Sanctions, uh, the initiative from the uh, Geoeconomic Center of the Atlantic Council. So, uh, Mr. Moore, welcome, and the floor is yours. 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much uh, to Mr. Mahmoud, as well as Dr. Castaneda uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you for the to the CSGEF. Um, you know, it's a, it's a real honor to share this panel with such accomplished experts. Um, I'll try to add to, you know, the excellent presentation that Adam just gave. By way of introduction, you know, the Atlantic Council Geoeconomic Center really sits at the intersection of economics, finance, and foreign policy. And our goal is very much to bridge that divide between those silos and uh, siloed sectors, and then, uh, you know, try to inform better uh, economic policy. Today, you know, talking about on global economic governance trends, more maybe from a recent uh, perspective, um, look at, looking from the U.S. out, um, I think there's sort of three initial takeaways. Um, first, I think there's a distinctively mixed picture for the effectiveness of global economic governance um, to the recent crises. Uh, there are some successes of multilateral engagement, but many failures. Second, I think you just see uh, gridlock across many international bodies and not in small small part as a result of the US uh, China strategic competition really heating up. And then as Adam, you know, really already talked about, I think for the US domestic reform really takes priority over, you know, reforming global governance at the moment. Um, so let me start with the good. I think the, the global tax deal is, is really a, a, a great example here. It was sort of resuscitated at the G7 and then negotiated at the OECD, you know, almost 140 countries uh, agreeing for companies to pay, you know, at least 15% tax. Obviously, you know, COVID, the, the devastating global impact of the crisis was a great motivator to get the deal done. And it still has to be implemented at the domestic level in the US and, and everywhere else. But I think the takeaway here is that advanced economies at the G7 level managed to leverage, leverage the OECD to, to achieve sort of a broader agreement on a very uh, thorny, important issue. Um, and I think that could be a blueprint uh, for future global governance efforts through the OECD. Um, you know, I'm thinking something like the CBAM, so a carbon border adjustment mechanism um, could be something that, you know, would be done in a similar way in the future. Um, moving on, I think, uh, we see a sort of decidedly more mixed picture at the G20. You know, uh, Mr. Mahmoud alluded to it earlier, but I think it's, it hasn't been as effective in its response to the pandemic compared to the global financial crisis. Obviously, it came of age during the, the global financial crisis with the establishment of the Financial Stability Board and, and you know, amplifying the voice of, of larger emerging markets. But with that US-China uh, competition really heating up, I think the G20, there, there's a risk that the G20 is going to lose its role as a driver of policy cooperation and compromise to address these serious problems as we see sort of a, a increase in the, in, in the lack of trust um, that, that undermines the incentives to, to reach compromise. Um, you know, if you look at the recent summit in Italy, you know, there were some there were some real failures. No, no agreement on expediting the global distribution of COVID vaccines. No long term agreement on on you know easing the debt burden for low income countries. Um, there were some successes. I mentioned the tax deal, and then um, you know uh, more advanced, richer countries agreed on channeling 100 billion SDR of the SDR allocation to low income countries. The suspension of U.S steel and aluminum tariffs, you know, a, a few successes, but um, I think the Bretton, you know, with regards to Bretton Woods, the, the, um, the IMF SDR distribution kind of stands out as a bright, bright point uh, in response to the pandemic. 
um, on on trade, the US EU deal is good news, but you know, the major global governance body for trade, the WTO, and I know that uh, um, Claudia is going to talk about that a little bit more, but uh, you know, the, it really remains paralyzed with the appellate body still out of order. I think from a US perspective, it's really all three pillars of the WTO. So negotiations, implementation, monitoring, as well as dispute settlement all require reform. Um, you know, the addressing non-market oriented policies, you know, related to unfair trade practices, govern new, govern, uh, new, new technologies, especially digital trade. Um, and of course, improving provisions on uh, intellectual property uh, services trade. Uh, all of that is, is very urgent, but um, of course the ministerial at the beginning of this month was postponed, but you know, we're still trying to get that agreement on, on the fishery subsidies um, and, and haven't been able to do it. So it's not, it's not a great sign. Um, in response, I think a, a trend that we see is countries um, you know, forming small groups to try to uh, achieve compromises. You saw, you see it with the US, EU, Japan trilateral that started in early 2020. They just met again last week, sort of to expand the type of subsidies prohibited under what WTO rules. That's the space to watch, I think. And then similarly, um, the recently established e US, EU Trade and Technology Council, TTC, which is very much uh, looking toward, uh, you know, avoiding future trade tensions in the transatlantic uh, space, but then of course aligning U.S. EU approaches toward China. So, you know, the, the key um, takeaways from their initial meeting, really looking at supply chain resilience, AI standards, digital economy, as well as, um, you know, at multilateral efforts to kind of um, align on export controls as well as investment screening. And in that area, from the Atlantic Council perspective, um, you know, with regards to China, I think other areas that the US and EU will likely uh, work closer on in the future is also competition subsidies, um, potentially, you know, expanding the purview of, of CFIUS uh, as, a, as a foreign subsidies instrument, looking closer at forced labor and human rights, as well as responding to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, you know, trying to put US EU initiatives under a single multilateral labor label um, and, and trying to drive uh, standards for, for high quality infrastructure at, at the G7, the OECD, and maybe the G20 as well. Um, I think, you know, for more effective global governance from a, from a US perspective, again, the, the, the domestic reforms are really important to, to address uh, you know, the rise in wealth, wealth income, intergenerational inequality within the US, but other advanced economies as well. And then at the international level, to really ask fundamental questions whether you know, these institutions that we talk about, but specifically IMF, World Bank, as well as WTO, do they still serve the purpose for which they were created? How can they be reformed? Uh, or would different institutions work better? Um, the small plug for our, for our center here, we are just starting a big research uh, project just on that question, and, and we will present our findings at the night, next IMF annual meetings, hopefully in Morocco. So with that, um, back to you, Dr. Castaneda. Thank you very much.